Hello, and welcome to another episode of Cracking Addiction with Philippe and Noren and Fergal Armstrong. In the episode of Cracking Addiction today, we're going to be talking about cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And I don't know about you, Fergal, but it seems that the general knowledge of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome amongst um, the population at large is increasing over time. Uh, it used yeah. to be one of those niche medical facts that only only doctors or or health professionals knew about, but it's it's one of those things where uh, in in my general practice, I've had patients come in uh, with the diagnosis themselves or or talking about it. I, I don't know if that's mm. been your experience as well, but but I find it quite interesting. Well, I mean, my personal experience was that you know, ten years ago, I'd never heard of it, you know, and now it's as you say, becoming much more mainstream, which I suppose can only be a good thing. But first of all. What do you understand What, by its term? What does it mean? What is it? Well, the term itself gives <clears throat> itself away. So hyperemesis it essentially is a large amount of vomiting. And mm. with cannabis, it's, it's a, a condition where one is constantly vomiting and it's thought that the chronic cannabis use is the causative agent. But it does fall under that umbrella of cyclic vomiting syndromes, and there's a, mm. a, a gamut of cyclic vomiting syndromes. That, that could probably fill mm. up a podcast library in and of itself, the different vomiting syndromes. Uh, but with regards to, to chronic cannabis use, it, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of the time, especially in our chemotherapy patients, we give cannabis as, as an anti-emetic sometimes, yet here we have uh, cannabis as as the causative agent for for vomiting. Do you, could you tell yeah. us um, something about the the pathogenesis of or why it's thought that this might occur? Yeah, there are a number of theories, and, and the bottom line is the more theories about pathogenesis there are, the less likely we actually know what's going on, right? But there are a number of theories. So theory number one is that. Um, the, the metabolic byproducts of phytocannabinoid metabolism are the agents that over time accumulate and cause cannabis hyperemesis. And that would explain why medicinal cannabis products are used to treat emesis. And yet chronic cannabis use can actually cause hyperemesis because I've always struck, it's always struck me as, you know, that, that paradox. Another, another theory is the accumulation theory whereby we know that cannabinoids are very lipid soluble and so they gradually accumulate in fat structures and the brain is full of fat. And so the theory is that over time, cannabis accumulates in structures of the brain, including the limbic system and the hypothalamus. And really you, you only start getting cannabis hyperemesis when you get to a trigger point or a trigger point concentration. Now, I quite like that theory because it explains a couple of things. It, it explains the prolonged time duration between the onset of cannabis use and the onset of cannabis hyperemesis. So basically, you're just topping up the levels in these particular brain structures. So it, it, it explains the long time, but it also explains the long tail with cannabis hyperemesis, where it can take up to three months of abstinence for the thing to go away. So this gradual onset, gradual offset really, I think, fits in nicely with the accumulation theory. Another theory that I've heard is it's a result of the imbalance between central anti-emetic anti factors and peripheral hyperemetic factors. In particular, we know that cannabis can delay gastric emptying. So it's got this local effect in the stomach, the peripheral effect, and a delay in gastric emptying, of course, causes vomiting. And then we've got the central anti-emetic effect of cannabis. So when, it, when, the, when cannabis enters the brain, it, it's, it's, it's an anti-emetic. And so basically over time, you end up with the peripheral effect superseding the, the central effect. And that's when you start developing hyperemesis. Another issue is, is it may be involved with the valinoid, the valinoid receptor, because of course we do know that capsaicin can treat this. So, you know, there are, there are theories that are actually associated with, you know, non-cannabinoid receptors. What's your take on the cause of this? I've heard all the I've, I've heard all the theories you've mentioned. I've not heard anyone give me like a definitive answer as to as to what exactly is going on. <laughs> and I think that is yeah. 
kind of mirrored in the treatment and the management of this condition because it is mm. still somewhat poorly managed and poorly treated in 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 practice uh when you've got yeah. four plus theories on the origins of a syndrome <laughs> you're not off to a good start yeah. and then essentially <laughs> when you're trying to treat the condition thereafter you're you're really behind the eight ball and to get the ball rolling with 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 some of the treatment options, uh, I think the hallmark of of all treatments advise abstinence from canna- cannabis use as as the first intervention, mm-hmm. uh, and thereafter yeah. it's largely symptomatic management until the the patient resolves. And it's you start off usually with the typical antiemetic, so your 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 metoclopramides, um, your your, your stematils uh, on on Danzatron. And then you start going down uh, down the rabbit hole of you mentioned the valinoid receptor and and topical capsaicin, um, which is uh, usually a, a pain uh, management uh, medication and that usually decreases substance mm. P in, in pain management. But for because mm. of its um, interaction with the receptor, we we use that for for uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And then for real refractory nausea, you've got your agents such as droperidol or, or haloperidol as well, potentially. So you've got, mm. you've got quite a few options, but I, mm. I'd be lying if I said, uh, I've, I've, I've adequately treated someone with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, like with, with one intervention. Usually it's, it's a couple of interventions that, that do the trick over time. And sometimes it does take, like you mentioned, weeks to months to kind of get a, a total handle on this. Has, has your experience been any different treating cannabis hyperemesis, Virgil? Yeah, there's no magic bullet. And I think the holistic approach has got to be the, the, the only approach really that is appropriate. I mean, to your list, I would add, well, first of all, we need to also rehydrate. I sometimes feel that just giving someone IV fluids calms things down a lot. So giving them IV fluids and also in that milieu of med interventions that you've described, I would also use benzodiazepines. My personal hierarchy is IV fluids, antiemetics, benzodiazepines, and then the antipsychotics. I tend not to use uh, capsaicin. There's no particular rhyme or reason to that. It's just really, it never really struck me as a particularly useful adjunct. Um, and I suppose that's because I've always associated it as with one of the hallmarks of kind of cannabis hyperemesis, which is this compulsive hot bathing. And it's actually, there's a theory that, uh, that as, as we all know, that cannabis hyperemesis is associated with the use of hot showers. And this is the theory that it's the actual temperature of the water that stimulates the valinoid or the vanilloid receptor in, on the stomach that actually helps the self-management of cannabis hyperemesis. And so I've always thought, well, patients have usually tried that. You know, I've, I've, I've never seen a patient come in with suspected cannabis hyperemesis who hasn't spent at least half an hour to 40 minutes underneath a hot shower and a hot bath before they've come to ED. So I've always thought, well, if you're going to be stimulating the same set of receptors that the patient's already tried to stimulate with a hot shower or a hot bath, well, what's the point? So that, I suppose that's one of the reasons why I, I tend not to use um, capsaicin. But, you know, it's, it's got a... It's got as good an evidence base in this condition as any other treatment in this condition, you know, i.e. we don't really have an evidence base for it. Um, so we've talked about the pathophysiology of why it might happen. and We've talked about the treatment hierarchy. I suppose, you know, let's talk about the diagnosis. We're doing this a little bit, you know, arse about face, but, you know, how, what, do, you, do you use any diagnostic criteria for, for the diagnosis of cannabis hyperemesis? It, it's a difficult one, mainly because I think it's poorly diagnosed because a lot of the people I see are, are using cannabis and if they're feeling nausea and, and they're vomiting, they automatically uh, are lumped with the diagnosis of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Personally, I just take a history and try and detail cannabis use and onset of symptoms and then see in my head if it is consistent with, with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. By and of itself, I don't use any classification systems. I just try and take a good detailed drug history and I try and make sure that um, I can kind of link cannabis use with the vomiting. So if someone has, say, used cannabis for one week and they start feeling nauseated and vomiting, that in and of itself is not consistent with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. So that's that's my approach anyway. Uh, 
do you have a, a classification system or approach, Virgil? Well, they, they did have the Rome 4 meeting and they came up with the cannabis hyperemesis uh, criteria. And I, I'm not sure if I can remember them all exactly, but basically my understanding is you've got to have prolonged heavy cannabis exposure. So as you say, a week of smoking, a couple of joints a week, it's not enough. Then you've got to have the actual hyperemesis syndrome. Now, remember the hyperemesis syndrome is, we're not talking about maybe one vomit a day. You know, you, you can be retching up to five times an hour with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And you're also looking for the prodrome, which can, which can occur for weeks to months prior, which basically involves morning nausea and morning anxiety. So you've got this anxiety and nausea in the morning, and then you start getting this hyperemesis phase where you end up with retching frequently within you know, every hour. And then we've got the associated features, which for me includes compulsive hot bathing or hot showers. And then, and this is the key, you know, that, that I've tried to explain to a lot of my colleagues. You need to exclude the differential diagnosis because it is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have someone who smokes joints and comes in puking their, uh, their ring out. You cannot just say, oh, it's cannabis hyperemesis. You have to exclude the differentials. So what do you think would be, you know, from, from a general practice point of view, what kind of differentials do you think would be important? Uh, I think for, say, it depends on the patient demographic that you've got, but say if you've got a, a, a <clears throat> woman of reproductive age, pregnancy would probably be the, the mm. first one I would exclude. Yeah. And then working yeah. um, working from that, is it, it, could there be some esophageal motility issue? Could this be gourd? Could, could it be any one of the common cyclic vomiting syndromes and like i've said there are a lot of different cyclic vomiting syndromes particularly in children and adolescents so one really does have to take a good history and like you mentioned exclude organic pathology because you really don't want to miss a, a, a chronic cause and just attribute it to cannabis hyperemesis syndrome and tell a patient to be abstinent and send them on their merry way and and uh, not treat them appropriately so, I mean, there's a couple of things that, that you've triggered in me. I mean, you know, on my list of differentials is basically the acute abdomen, which includes pancreatitis and cholecystitis. But then also, I think if you've got someone with a decent history of query cannabis hyperemesis, I think it's important to exclude porphyria and Addison's. You, you do not want to be missing those two diagnoses, and they, they do produce significant vomiting. And porphyria does, an acute porphyria crisis is a source of abdominal pain. Um, as is Addison's. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the cyclical vomiting syndromes, I think the other thing that I always think about when I consider cyclical vomiting is migraine, especially in adolescents. And again, it's very typical to, or quite common rather to have an adolescent who started smoking a joint, maybe having one or two joints and coming in with profuse uh, vomiting. You know, um, it's, and yeah, I don't think you should leap to this is cyclical, uh, sorry, this is cannabis hyperemesis before you think about, well, is this migraine? and cyclical vomiting syndrome. So for me, those are the differentials. So we've talked about the, the pathophysiology, the diagnostic criteria, the, the management, the differential diagnosis. What else would you say about um, cannabis hyperemesis? Then? I think it's important to take a, a view of, of the whole patient. I, I, I remember a case recently where, where I saw a, a, a patient who'd been smoking cannabis for, for, for quite a few years, really decades, and no issues with vomiting, no issues with hyperemesis. Um, and then uh, they, they became uh, pregnant and then uh, started having nausea and vomiting. And essentially the thought was, could this be cannabis hyperemesis syndrome? And in, in reality, it, 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 she, she, it could be a number of different things that are causing her symptoms. She did have a period of abstinence where some of the vomiting symptoms improved partially and then started smoking cannabis again. But just to say this is a straight-cut cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, to me, it seemed too simplistic a view and not really consistent with the criteria that one would use to diagnose cannabis hyperemesis when there are many other causes of exclusion that 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 were still to be excluded. Uh, do you get cases like this where the diagnosis is not necessarily clear cut? It, certainly, there is a pot, there is a potential for cannabis hyperemesis, but it wouldn't be the first thing I'd be rushing to to kind of label the patient's constellation of symptoms. 
Yes, Philippe, and I think pretty much all of the cases that we see are, are, are grey. And, and I think that speaks to two things. First of all, it speaks to the fact that cannabis hyperemesis has to be a diagnosis of exclusion. And secondly, you know, addiction medicine is as much an art, if more so, than a science, if not more so than a science. So, so really, yeah, it, 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 it's very rare that you get a clear cut case where there's absolutely no possible alternative diagnosis. Um, you know, how do we go approaching that? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a pragmatist. Treat it, and if it gets, if the patient gets better, great. If the patient doesn't get better, well, you need to think again. So long as you're not missing serious pathology, and really, in your case, I mean, we've got this lady who's pregnant. Um, I mean, you know, how do they know? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a bit, bit skeptical about making a diagnosis of cannabis hyperemesis rather than the hyperemesis gravidarum, especially in someone who doesn't necessarily have that prolonged heavy exposure to cannabis uh, you know because without that history then, then you really are getting the, the gray area of, of the differential diagnosis so i guess in in summary it's been a, a another action-packed episode of cracking addiction where we've talked about cannabis hyperemesis syndrome the diagnostic criteria uh, the treatment options and how the diagnosis can be somewhat murky and we do need to make sure that we take a good patient history and exclude other sinister causes and other causes of cyclic vomiting. So thank you once again for your attention on this episode and bye for now.